Thanks, Santa. Thanks for the introduction and the invitation to speak here today. It's a, it's a pleasure, um, if slightly daunting, to follow Susan, who was my registrar almost 20 years ago. So all I can assume is that she has a, a portrait in an attic somewhere. But um, and just to congratulate her on, and her team and all the fantastic work they've done through the course of the pandemic. So when I started pre preparing this talk and when I chose my title, um, I thought the tone of the talk would be different. Uh, so I've had to adjust it in view of um, events of the last week. So. Unfortunately, I suppose in Ireland over the last week, we've seen an increase in our 14-day uh, cumulative incidence. Things are probably not going as well as we would have liked them to go. So for those of you who are on social media, so, and so the, the too long didn't read message to take home is that it, it is very much not it, unfortunately. Um, and what we are, so this, uh, these are global figures uh, looking at the number of, these are thing from Wednesday. So global figures looking at the number of cases, looking at the number of deaths. And on that day, there were about 340,000 or 365,000, sorry, new cases on the day. So certainly the, the pandemic is going strong, unfortunately, at this stage, on a, certainly at a global level. In Ireland, if we look more locally, these are data from the Health Protection Surveillance Centre. So on the left-hand side, we're looking at uh, um, wastewater surveillance programs, looking at, uh, this is a collaboration with colleagues in UCD and, uh, and Irish Water, uh, looking at a virus in wastewater across the world. So on the left-hand side of this graph, you can see um, working from left to right. Unfortunately, the red on the right-hand side of that graph is, is very predominant and indicates detectable RNA in pretty much all the, the sampling centres that we're looking at at the moment. On the right-hand side, again, we're looking at HPSC data, looking at the seven-day incidence as a proportion of the 14-day incidence and unfortunately red indicates that the epidemic is growing locally in pretty much all counties that we're looking at with the exception there of Meath and Offaly. Similarly, if we look at the five-day uh, rolling average, it's also been trending up. It's now around sort of 1,650. Again, these are data probably as up to Thursday, I think. If we look at the positivity rate from the lab side, we can also see that that's increasing as well. So over on the left-hand side, we're comparing week 13 of 2020 to week 40 of 2021, at which stage the positivity rate is 5.5%. Uh, and then if we look at week 40 in 2021, it's 7.3%. So and that's demonstrated graphically over on the right-hand side. So we're still doing a lot of testing. Um, thankfully, the majority of tests are still negative, but the positivity rate is increasing. And I suppose the other thing I just wanted to highlight, so this is a summary of the epidemic curve across the whole pandemic in Ireland. And really what I'm highlighting is just the, the burden, the force of infection. If you look, we've had higher peaks with previous waves. And I suppose it's funny, there is a, there's a technical discussion about what a wave is and what isn't a wave, because we've never actually gone down, back down to baseline after the start of wave two. So certainly we've had, we've had an alpha wave, we've had a delta wave, we've had a Spanish wave, but realistically we're probably still in the second wave. We've never suppressed this virus completely since, um, since last year. But I just want to compare the, the bulk of infection. The, so while the peak is not necessarily significant in the context of, say, delta versus alpha, if you look at the, the high baseline that has been sustained over the last number of months, there's a huge amount of infection in the community at this stage. And that's very challenging to bring under control, especially as we're trying to ease restrictions and move towards some semblance of normality. If we look at the uh, birth, our birth cohorts and the different age ranges again. So this is a day, these are data looking from week 26 to week 40, and you can see that where we where we did have a nice smattering of green about 10 weeks ago. Pretty much every age group now is moving towards yellow. Some are moving towards orange, and you can see even this, um, at a national level where these are weekly cumulative incidence rates. So we're we're pushing up towards the 200 mark. So it is a concern across the board. And then finally, I suppose the positive news to take out of all of these data is that the, these are, this is a graph of the deaths again from HPSC data. So you can see what we saw in 2020, what we saw over December, January, and thankfully over on the right-hand side of this graph where you see the green arrow, we can see that thankfully the number of deaths has been significantly reduced by the advent and the introduction of the vaccination campaign. And I think that's a really positive message for the next um, few months and years, hopefully. So, if that's not it at the start of my talk, why is that? So I'm going to touch on three things, the virus, the vaccine, and then, and then human behaviour. So these are data from Public Health England, and I, I know I noticed sort of the report um, earlier in the week that criticised the, the British government for their response during the pandemic, but, but certainly from an Irish virology perspective, I really just want to compliment the scientists and the medics and PHE, Susan, and a lot of her colleagues who have done incredible work over the course of the pandemic and really have led the way in the context of the circulating variants of concern and sharing their data in real time as, as soon as they had it. So these are some data from the PHE, and what 
well, I'm not done of great, don't have time to go into great detail in the context of S gene dropout, but just what I'm looking at here is the bottom half of this graph, and you can see what happened in the course of between, say, the middle of April, second half of April, and June in the UK. Um, the virus switched from S gene target failure being prevalent to S gene positivity, and that was the switch from alpha back to delta, and that was when delta emerged. And so the UK again flagged this in real time and they updated uh, Delta as, or as it was then B1617.2 to, to a variant of concern on May 6th and then they were able to, as I said, they shared those data in real time and we were able to start monitoring. So looking at Delta, it really was a different beast. Comparing, to all of this, comparing its growth rate to all of the other variants of concern we had seen up till then, you can see in the magenta line here, it just really was in a league of its own. And again, if we look at the UK experience, so the, they were looking at the, the first slide I, show, I showed, sorry, these are based on PCR data, the S gene target failure data, and this was subsequently confir confirmed then based on whole genome sequencing data. So in light pink here, we can see these, these is an alpha background, and you can see from the start of April to the end of June, over that two month period, Delta in magenta or sort of lilac here just became completely dominant. And we saw a similar picture in Ireland, albeit a month or so later. So we first started start seeing small numbers of cases in, of Delta in or around the start of April. So these are whole genome sequencing data from the Health Protection Surveillance Report. And you can see we had small numbers of cases from about week 15 up to about week 21, which is about the end of May. And then, again, very similar to the UK picture, you can see that from week 23, having established itself, it just kicked off completely. So on this graph, we're looking at pink is alpha, and then red on the right-hand side is delta. And for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, sort of the weeks of the year as we use them from a surveillance perspective, week 23 is the June bank holiday. So that's when it kicked off. This is a copy of the, just the risk assessment that the UK PHE would have done at the time. And obviously, we knew delta was more transmissible. It was concern about infection severity. And I suppose the greater concern was about the impact on the vaccine effectiveness. And this had a significant role to play, or this generated significant levels of concern, certainly after one dose, as people will remember. However, again, as the positive news versus when we look at infection versus um, severe disease was that the vaccines remain very well. So this are, are very effective. So this is a slide that many people will have seen. This is from the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and this from the Moderna vaccine. We saw similar pictures for AstraZeneca and for, for Johnson & Johnson. I just didn't have time to show them here today. But the good news published by uh, Susan and her colleagues in the New England Journal was that there were only modest differences in vaccine effectiveness noted with the Delta variant. So the vaccination was still one of the ways out of this pandemic. The problem is there's, we have a problem with Delta. So just to try and put this in context, when we talk about trying to eliminate or control infections, or when we talk about community level protection, which is a term that I prefer to herd immunity, if we look at, if we take measles, the MMR, for example, just by way of comparison, and I'm going to just take rubella in the interest of time. So the reproductive number for rubella is about between six and seven. However, the vaccine effectiveness is between 99 and 100% with a single dose. And the community level protection as a crude measure, the, the, the threshold for community level protection based on the reproductive number is between 83 and 85 percent. And we know from, from our national immunization program that we get an uptake of greater than 92 percent for that vaccine. So the, the net result of putting all of those figures together is that you in, eliminate endemic rubella. And that's what we've done in Ireland. Similarly, we're, we've eliminated endemic measles in Ireland. But the reason we haven't done it with mumps, even though the reproductive number isn't significantly different, is because the vaccine is less, effectiveness, uh, less effective against mumps. Now, obviously, the pandemic has had a significant impact on all of these viruses, but people will remember that we had regular and frequent outbreaks of mumps, certainly in the third level setting uh, prior to the pandemic. So this is, that is, so in relation to the Delta variant of SARS coronavirus type two, we are looking at a reproductive number of probably somewhere between five and eight, the, the people can discuss that. The community level protection threshold, therefore, is probably between 80 and 88 percent. And if we look at vaccine effectiveness based on the recent Lancet data, and I'm not going to get into the sort of criticizing or reviewing that paper here, but just by way of example, the threshold of effectiveness is given as about 75 percent, ranging from 91 percent after a month to about 53 percent after four or five months. Our vaccine uptake rate, based on the greater than those aged greater than 12, is about 88 percent. So, unfortunately, putting all those sums together that doesn't get elimination or eradication or control of Delta. So that's where we need to, that's what we need to think about. It doesn't mean that we can't include other measures, but from a vaccination perspective, they're the data that we have and they're the figures that we're looking at. 
The other concern in the context of vaccination, and, and Susan has alluded to some of this, this is really nice um, data from, from UK colleagues. Again, this is a preprint. On the left-hand side, we're looking at the viral load and the viral kinetics for a range of different viruses. So the Wuhan or pre-alpha, alpha in green, and then vaccinated and unvaccinated delta in blue and purple. And unfortunately, what, these, what the authors have concluded is that while vaccination reduces the risk of infection and causes some changes to viral kinetics, fully vaccinated individuals with breakthrough infections have a peak upper respiratory tract viral load that is similar to unvaccinated cases and can efficiently transmit infection in household settings, including to fully vaccinated contacts with a secondary attack rate, I think, somewhere in the region of about 20%. So we have a long way to go from a vaccination perspective, notwithstanding the fact that the vaccines are phenomenal. And certainly, I don't think we thought 12 months ago, certainly I didn't, that we would be here with a, such a range of effective vaccines. So the thing I suppose I want to fi finish up on then is, is, so we've looked at the virus, we've looked at the vaccines, and, and the thing is ultimately we're looking at human behaviour. And I think it's important to highlight that this, this is not me criticising anybody, the population in Ireland especially has, has done phenomenally well over the last 18 months. But if we just look at what has happened over the last 18 months. So this, is a, this was a, 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 a pre-alpha variant, if you like, that basically was just found, that didn't have a transmission advantage. This was B1177, and this is a so-called Spanish variant that spread through um, Europe spread throughout Europe over the summer of 2020 and the authors found no evidence that the variant had increased transmissibility but instead demonstrated how sort of just confounding factors like a rising incidence in Spain, the resumption of travel and the lack of effective screening would explain this variant's success. And unfortunately looking at this slide and all of the different countries you can see that Whatever Irish people were doing for the Irish economy in 2020, they were certainly doing an awful lot for the Spanish economy in summer of 2020 because we're up there, a very high level of prevalence. And it looks like this virus is introduced hundreds of times to a variety of European countries. And this we see, and if we look at the next strain data over the, the first year of our pandemic, we can see that B1177 over on the right hand side became completely dominant and prevalent over the course of the after summer of 2020. And it was then supplanted or replaced by, by Alpha. And if we look at what happened with Alpha, when Alpha came in, so again, with the, I suppose, the increased socialization and the increased personal contact that we associate with a Christmas period in Ireland, we obviously had a significant peak of cases. And what happened was then that provided an opportunity for Alpha to become dominant as it did. And what we see dramatically here is that the public health measures that we had in place before Christmas, didn't, we didn't get the same bang for our book after Christmas purely because this virus was so significantly more transmissible than, than pre-Alpha variants. And that's where we stood until May. So this, if we look at, these are some Irish sequence data looking at sort of a, from a phylogenetics perspective. And if you look at May, 2021, this is where we are. So if you consider this like a clock face, really from about 11 o'clock up till around half past eight, all of that is alpha. There's still some diversity, as you can see from the, the legend in the center of the phylogenetic tree, but all of the diversity is being squashed into the area where that green arrow is, and this is where we were up till May. And then this happened, obviously, Delta. So again, Delta would have become dominant anyway because of its increased transmissibility, but you can see quite clearly that the bank holiday, we, if you remember back, we eased restrictions um, just in advance of the Friday of the bank holiday weekend, and people just interacted more. And again, I stress this is not a criticism, this is an observation of what happened and an observation of human behaviour. Viruses, there's an... There's a convenient narrative that viruses drive a lot of things. Viruses don't drive a lot of things. They don't have hands, they don't have feet. Viruses will follow the, the crowd most, almost literally. They still transmit from person to person and there's very little that they can do unaided. And so this is where we are now based on, if we look at the last sort of three or four months, pretty much everything on the, if, again, looking at from the clock face, you can look at alpha has really been restricted down to almost sort of a, a very narrow band at about nine o'clock um, on this clock face, whereas everything else now is delta or delta-like or sublineages thereof. And if you look at the bottom half of this, I'm not sure, sorry now, how well this uh, port uh, is projecting in, in colour, but the red at the bottom half is one of the sublineages, which is AY4 of delta, and at the moment that seems to be dominant. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily seem to have any implicit advantage that we know of quite yet, but it does, it maybe appears that Delta might be the one, at least a near optimal configuration for SARS coronavirus type two. There may be a better one in the coming months or the coming years, but the way it's diversifying now and evolving suggests that it, it kind of has the playing field to itself and this is what's going to happen. So I suppose it does come back to we the people at the end of the day. The virus is 
surfing a wave. So whatever opportunity we give it to, to spread and to transmit, that's what will happen. So while we're very keen to see the end of this pandemic, it's important that we don't see vaccination. Certainly the current generation of vaccines will not be sufficient in and of themselves to control this pandemic. So in conclusion, I suppose slightly negatively, we don't get to decide when this is over, unfortunately. It's not our call. That we will reach an equilibrium with this virus at some stage between the vi between us as a new host. Bear in mind, we're a brand new host of this virus. And then from an evolutionary perspective, we're very recent. So we don't know how long that will take. We can try and learn from pre previous seasonal human coronavirus, which has obviously only caused mild illness now, but we don't know when they cross the species barrier and we don't know how long it took for them to get to that stage. But pandemic viruses don't just disappear. This, and again, people will get very agitated when we look to try and learn from 1918. There's nothing wrong with learning from 1918. Obviously, flu and SARS-CoV-2 are different viruses, but we can learn from previous pandemics. And that seasonal, that 1918 virus didn't disappear until 2000. And well, it disappeared in 57 for 20 years because it was supplanted by H2N2. It came back in 77 and remained our seasonal influenza virus until 2009, when it was replaced by 2009's pandemic influenza virus. And that virus from 2019-18 actually still provided some of the backbone for 2009. So pandemic viruses don't just disappear. For me, population immunity is going to be the key. And that's going to be a com combination of vaccine-induced immunity and also natural exposure and boosting. That's generally what happens uh, even when we get infected with chickenpox as a child. If there's chickenpox circulating in the community, it tops up our immunity as we get older. And that's one of the reasons why when you introduce vaccination for chickenpox in childhood, you do get a knock-on effect because you drive primary infection to an older cohort. So all of these things have to be considered. And bear in mind, we'll also have a new birth cohort, which increases susceptibility to population. But to finish on a positive note, I think we've done some really good things in this pandemic and we have to learn from that and be better prepared for the next one, which there will be. HSE has done incredible work in investing in laboratory testing capacity, both in the hospitals and in the community. We do need to do better from an investment in public health perspective because we've been overly reliant, to my mind at least, on, on assistance from the private sector in the context of investigating outbreak, uh, outbreaks and contact tracing um, and while they've been very useful we really need a, a more robust public health system for for the coming pandemics we do want to improve our data flows and real-time analysis and that's not to criticize the HPSC because they've done phenomenal work but again we needed support from the private sector and that's fine in the context of the pandemic you bring in the best and brightest and you get as many people working on things as you can but we really want to improve our IT structures with individ individual health identifiers and our national laboratory information management system which should make things better and then surveillance for me will be key over the coming years and we can learn a lot from our sentinels flu uh, sentinel surveillance system for influenza but we need to build on the wastewater surveillance we have uh, at the moment and also we need to look at vaccine breakthrough infections and i think that's uh, my final slide is just to say this is from ian mckay an australian virologist and it's the, the swiss cheese model so unfortunately there's no silver bullet we've all been looking for a single intervention over the course of this pandemic that gets rid of it and there isn't one vaccines are one slice of cheese uh, and it's an imperfect slice of cheese but as I said the more we can con con continue to follow the the behaviors that we have in place the better that we can do and I'll say thank you very much.